the very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we get started with today's discussion, just a reminder that we have a Patreon account that can be located at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. If not, consider throwing us a nice review on iTunes. Today, we're taking our first dive, at least for me, into the work of Quentin Mayasu. A couple of pieces, one entitled Metaphysics, Speculation, and Correlation, translated by our own, Mr. Taylor Atkins, and then a second text from L'Existence Divine, <laughs> um, <laughs> another piece from Quentin Mayasu, translated by Nathan Brown. How are yeah. you feeling about this material? You know what sucks is not all of Warwick Journal of philosophy ply, or plea, le plea, right, the fold. Not all of their journals are online. I had to dig through like 10,000 emails from my old email account to find the drafts that I sent you to find, yeah. I think it's volume 22, 2011 on contingency. So it's a kind of a, it's more or less half of the journal issue is devoted to, to Maya Sue. I have a hardback version of it, but I felt like it would be fine. And uh, so that was 2011, which is a pretty good recapitulation of After Finitude, which comes out in English, I think around what, 2008, 2009, I think originally in French, it's in 2006. And Brassier translated the original, or was the original English translation, I believe, at least according to the Yes, he did. Dictionary. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. Brassier uh, translated after Finitude, like two years after it came out. I think we even discussed this with him. I was like, how'd you get this translated so fast? You know, and he's like, oh, well, he's my buddy. You know, stuff like that. I like, And it's not too long of a text. It is dense and well-argued, but also well-written. He's, he's pretty clear you know, comparatively, right, to the continental philosophy stuff. Yeah. I mean, honestly, though, this is the kind of philosophy that I sort of start to, my eyes yeah, start I crossing, and uh, I start getting very frustrated with how, like, mm -hmm. nuanced the uh, the thinking. It becomes so meta and abstract to, like, you know, thinking about non-thought and the yeah. like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read those and, like, parse that out. This reminds me a lot of, like, Husserl and, and that shit sort of an analytic bent to the yes, really yeah. i guess kant uh very much yes. of a, like drawing from this that sort of tradition like aristotle kant yeah kant and Husserl are, are going to be the heidegger team. obviously is right. big in this kind of lineage this uh it, ancestrality to bastardize one of mayasu's concepts a little bit you know he's definitely the main interlocutor is kant i think for the most part although yeah. obviously Husserl and heidegger have different variants of the correlation right, right. which we'll dive into I guess I'm just focusing on kind of like the aesthetic, sort of like the argumentation. It's a little bit different than reading, like not so much different from reading Deleuze solo, but Deleuze and Guattari. You know what I mean? There's a difference. Yeah. There's a different way of, I mean, even any of those kind of post structuralists, I don't think many are writing in this kind of fashion so much. Maybe Derrida gets into this kind because he's got a lot of Heideggerian sort of. Yeah. I think Baudrillard is going to be the, since he's one of your boys, right? He's going to be the furthest afield from this type of hardcore, as you said, quasi-analytic type of writing. Yeah. But the benefit is that it, unlike a lot of analytic writing, you know, peace unto them, it doesn't proceed naively or doesn't reject speculation in the way right. that he's he's going about it. So yeah. someone like someone like Wittgenstein, I think that like Mayasu reads kind of like Wittgenstein on the one hand, but he's taking problems that Wittgenstein has said are non-problems or pseudo problems very seriously. One of the main ones is why are things the way they are instead of otherwise? For Wittgenstein, that's a silly question. 
for Mayus, who that's a very serious question. He takes it seriously. And he says for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> right. So we'll get to jump into that. What he calls unreason or in my translation, uh, irreason. Irreason. It's the same thing. Gotcha. Um, I like irreason a little bit better. But unreason also captures the fact that there's no principle sufficient reason for why, why things are the way they are. Right. We've totally broken with that Leibnizian. Un- unreason as opposed to non reason, too. I don't know. I don't know. Right. What's the difference there if there is one? Or what it's, do you think? It's that the absence of reason is completely rational. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not necessarily irrational, right? It's like, that's the interesting thing for Mayasu and to argue it rationally, why there is no reason for things to be rather than not be or to be the way they are rather than otherwise. There is no necessary reason for that. And that's why contingency is absolutely necessary for him. The only absolutely necessary you can't even call it a thing, right? Because contingency, all beings are contingent. Contingency right. itself is not a being. So even to say it's the only necessary thing is is a slippage. It's the only necessary principle. Yeah. You Abs- call it a principle. Well, it's not an absolute, is it? Or is yeah, it? you could say contingency or facticity because he'll equate those two is the absolute or it's necessity. It's the only thing that's necessary. Contingency to be absolute. Before, if contingency itself were contingent, then it would be contradictory and it, then things could be necessary, blah, blah, blah. We'll get into that, though. This is kind of the fun stuff that you're talking about, right? This I was actually going to say that before we get into the kind of the nitty gritty of, of the yeah. piece, maybe because I think you'll be able to speak to this very well, because I think this is kind of like your sort of early heydays in terms of speculative realism and maybe like talk about that project or maybe not project, but you know what I mean? It's like at least a kind of sort of movement or like half a gesture towards a type of progression in the history of continental right. thought. We discussed this a little bit with Brazier, but I actually didn't bring it up where and, there's that famous, I say famous, there's a kind of, with the rise of the blogosphere in the late aughts, right? 2005 onward. If you want to bracket it, it's like that half decade, 2005 to 2015 or so. There's There's a lot of, at least for me, since I was a part of it, there's a lot of interesting activity going on with, with blogs becoming a kind of an easy way to share philosophical thinking. I've mentioned on the podcast, it's been a while though, that this was the way I started using the blog was just to put up drafts of translations just to have out there, many of which were like Laura Wells' work. And for that end, you know, I, I joined a group with Nick Cernasek and Ben uh, Woodard called a speculative heresy. And it was going to be more or less covering what is loosely called speculative realism. And I mentioned the the kind of famous celebrated, it was kind of a conference in 2007 at Goldsmiths in the UK, where it had Graham Harmon, Ian Hamilton Grant, Ray Brazier, Quentin Mayasu, and they all, that since that coincided kind of with the blogosphere times, speculative realism in general, supposedly holds those four together. Right. Yeah. And a lot of you could say one of the principles that holds it together is one of the things that may assume forefronts is getting away from post-Kantian correlational thinking. That thinking is always thinking for us. It's all, it's what Graham Harmon calls philosophies of access, right? That there is a correlation, there's an access to being between thought, thought subject, and, thought and body or thought and mind or, or subjects and objects is, is another oh, way of talking yeah, about yeah. it. Right. And Mayasu is one of the thinkers that takes this very seriously and, and tries to get us out of the correlation, out of this vicious circle of the correlation. <laughs> nice. And I guess I would say one or two more things. One is he rejects the term speculative realism. He'd rather call his approach speculative materialism. He says in a, in a talk he gave, I think a couple of years after after Finitude, that he recalls a famous quote from Foucault, where Foucault says, I'm a materialist because I don't believe in reality, <laughs> which I think is great. And so I think that that's, on the other hand, Mayasu will say that what science is, if anything, at base, if it's going to be science, at least in the modern sense, is always a realism. That may be the actual reason why he considers what he does as speculative materialism, because he's not actually doing science, right? even if he's thinking about how to make sense of what science says, what science says about the ancestral, you brought it up, what science says about events, beings, 
processes that occurred before the advent of life, thinking, subjectivity, right? The ancestral. When science says, when science kind of produces facts about what there was when there was no thinking, yeah. it's being it's being <laughs> realist, it's being realist in a way that that a transcendental philosopher or correlationist would have a problem with, right? Because they would say, well, it's it's for us in the present, right? You know, blah, blah, blah. We'll get into this. But I think that that's why he would say science is a realism, but the speculative philosophy he's proposing, it's a materialism. So I would, instead of the weird quote from Foucault, I don't believe in reality, which I think is great, but I think that that's the difference why he uh, doesn't consider it what he does a, a speculative realism. But the other parts of speculative realism, you know, like if you want to lo- loop in Laura Well in here, because I sometimes think of him in terms of speculative realism, yeah. Because he's 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 proposing to describe the one which is foreclosed to thought, and it's indifferent to its descriptions. Larwell himself, at least early on, I don't know if he still thinks of it this way, but he's always kind of called himself or what he does transcendental materialism, as opposed to like Kant's transcendental idealism or right. whatever you want to you want to say. That's kind of where I got interested in Mayasu in the blogosphere. There was a lot of coverage of that Goldsmiths conference in 2007. And that kind of spawned a lot of interest in the work of Brazier and Mayasu and Graham Harmon too, to some extent, I think. And I guess just for listeners, you can go back and we do bring up, you know, correlationism. Doesn't that come up in our discussion with uh, Harmon, if I'm not mistaken? That was the first time I remember Uh being kind of exposed to that concept. Yes. I think that uh, Harmon himself has a way of getting out of the correlation because for him, objects withdraw not just from our access, but they as much withdraw from each other into a kind of noumenal inaccessibility. And it all depends on the different approaches, right? Because at least on that front, I think Mayasu and, and Harmon agree that correlationism is, is so kind of simple yet subtle and difficult to overcome that it has to be taken seriously. So I think on that, they would agree. And Harmon has written a book on Maya Sue's work as well. Yeah, it's like Philosophy in the Making, I believe is what it's called. And it has some of the first excerpts from, yeah, it's called Quentin Maya Sue, Philosophy in the Making. It has some of the first excerpts from Divine in Existence, which was his PhD thesis. It was find it online, it's published in 1997. And, and that was the second piece we read for the day is some excerpts from it. Sadly, the stuff from it about the not yet God, right? The that's not in our, our piece, but it's something we might flirt with in our discussion today. And I'm up to riff on, uh, is what I called him today. I didn't get this from May. So this is just my way of phrasing it. It's like, God is not dead, but is not yet born, right? It's uh, just a play off of, of me. Yeah. Too, but. Yeah. Cause I think some of that could go back to the discussions we had with, uh, or the discussion with, um, with Chiesa a little bit slightly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he he discussed Mayasu a bit as well in that conversation. That's I right. Think, right? At least that's he, right. I feel like the name came up at least once or twice, just tangentially yeah. there. Yeah, that's right. I think the difference between Chiesa and Mayasu, before we move on, would be Chiesa's trying to formulate a way to reject weak atheism and agnosticism and be able to propel a strong agnosticism that gets us to strong atheism by a kind of, if I may say, an Occam's razor so to speak. And I think Mayasu is actually trying to take the aporia between the religious belief and atheism and split the untangle, the knot that makes them mirror images and miss each other, so to speak, right? You know, on the one hand, atheism saying God's non-existence is necessary. The religious saying God's existence is necessary. Mayasu is like, no, the only thing necessary is contingency, right? So that's kind of how he tries to mediate and not necessarily blend them together, but satisfy them both in a certain interesting way without instituting atheism or religion again. It's yeah. a tightrope. What I think is interesting, maybe possibly a good place to start. So I guess for me, trying to disaggregate imminence and contingency. Okay. Because I feel like they're not necessarily they're sort of parallel in my in my head at least. Do you want to go on? I guess I think of imminence as this way and everything hangs in a certain balance relative to everything else. Yeah. Okay. That's a, Which that's a way to put it. also goes to like within that, that arrangement is fully contingent as well. 
as long as you mean by arrangement, not contingency itself, because that for him is the only thing that's not contingent, right? It's contingency. Yes. Contingency would be absolute Mm -hmm. here. Yes. It'd be necessary as he calls it. Events follow one another, but there's no necessary correlation between those. There's no, no absolute necessity of the relation between objects, let's say. You're talking about Hume's problem, right? The causality problem that Hume has. Sort of, I guess. I mean, we could Mm -hmm. get to that because, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something I wanted to touch on because I feel like that's a nice little background for this kind of discussion of contingency, right? Because Hume is is an Ur skeptic, right? And sort of blows up this kind of notion of causality and like the infinite re. This is where infinite regress. Was he the first? He's not the first to. No, no. Hypothesize uh, infinite no. regress, though, or whatever, no, or like no. to critique it rather, I suppose. No, I mean, that's a that is definitely an old problem, but he does bring it up in, a, in an interesting way in terms of causality, especially. Right. I mean, my favorite example is the sun rose yesterday, so the sun will rise tomorrow. And he's like saying how that's built on habit and belief. We talked a lot about this, about this with John Rofe. The contingency and eminence thing, what I like about this, the way you phrased it, is the fact that for Mayasu and the way he lays out that in order to accept the fact that contingency itself is not contingent and therefore absolutely necessary, and the only principle following from that is the principle of non-contradiction, which we'll get to. But what's interesting about that is that for anything to be the way it is, there is no reason for it. And that includes physical laws, which is why the future could hold different physical laws biological laws, et cetera, for ASU. This is the hyper chaos part. I mean, we can imagine, we can imagine that easily. I mean, I think we can, you know, what's interesting too is like, you know, we can imagine or we can think about even spaces within our own universe where physical laws change or we react differently. Well, I would say, I I, I would say that, uh, that that could be a possibility. Obviously we don't know, but I think that the, that possibility is for Mayasu not a deficit of our understanding and reason, like in a Kantian way, but is actually in the things themselves. This is kind of one of the moves that Mayasu will always want to make, that the absence of any sufficient reason for things to be the way they are rather than otherwise or not be is not due to our incapacity of thinking. It's actually in the things themselves and precisely for no reason whatsoever. So to get back to contingency and eminence, what I like about this is that if contingency were itself contingent this would or if if the law of non-contradiction didn't fall from this then i should call it principle not a law but then there would be a necessary being like a god right and a god would be a transcendent reason Mm -hmm. for the for things for it would be a consistent principle of reason for for everything to be the way it is rather than otherwise right right so that's the imminence part is that since contingency is is absolutely necessary, there is no necessary being necess- that would be like cause of itself and therefore the cause of everything else. And this is, again is why divine is in existence is so interesting because it's saying there is not this metaphysical God the creator that caused things to, to be the way they are, nor mm-hmm. is there this religious God that's sort of watching over things and therefore responsible for all the injustice in the world. But perhaps within the hyper chaotic time that he's conceiving perhaps in the future in this kind of fourth time this fourth world of justice there could be this this god that does not yet exist like the quitsats heterac <laughs> i mean you know you can call it that i mean just to make that connection with dune but the thing would is that the future virtual god would itself be contingent and could just as easily not be or come into existence how does this not fall back on contingency itself as a sort of God or having the properties of some type of a God? Because it's not, what it does is- it, I guess gets, because it's imminent, but your, is contingency imminent? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think so. Yes, it's an imminent- right. It's an imminent. It's not a transcendental out there. It only exists within the, I don't know how that fucking, how does that it's, work with see, time, you know? But it's, it's not a transcendental in the sense in which Kant thinks it, because it's not about the conditions of possibility, because that gets us back into this realm of possibility, which cannot be applied to the set of all sets. It can only be applied to the whole, but there is no whole, right? We know that since Cantor, there's always bigger infinites 
you know, in the transfinite, there's always going to be a bigger one. There's an infinity of infinities that can't be totalized. So only within the, the realm of the totalizable can possibility reign. This is why contingency isn't, isn't another God, because a God would kind of close the loop and be a necessary being. So yes, contingency is imminent, as you said, but it also gets us to an infinite regress because it can't be, contingency can't itself be a kind of God figure because then it comes to saying, well, what, what guarantees what gave birth to God, what was before God, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you kind of say that contingency gave birth to itself, which starts to sound kind of silly. It's about an absence of reasons that's a positive determination rather than our inability to know in an agnostic sense or in a sense of not having access to a noumenon, something like this, right? Because what's interesting is that Mayus II will want to keep the in itself, but he will not want to have it as a inaccessibility to knowledge. It's not this Kantian limitation where I can't access the, I can't perceive the in itself, I can't know it, blah, blah, blah. No, I think for Mayus II, the in itself is that which is outside of the correlation. So ancestrality for, is, is just a good example of that. How can we think the events that preceded life, can, subjectivity, yeah, like, etc.? How can we think knowledge coming from non-knowledge? Yeah. Going back to Lacan, it would be like, how do we, is it the rational from the, ir, yeah, the rational from the irrational, the organic from the inorganic, etc.? Is it useful to look at any of this stuff relative to, you know, we talked about Yuma a bit, but going back to his kind of pool ball discussion, yeah, which I don't really remember super well. Well, well, the, what Hume focuses on is I I'm playing pool or billiards really. You know, right. You've got the, you've got the, what the red ball, the two, the two cue balls, and you're trying to hit what three sides of the billiards table and then hit the other two balls, right? That's how you get points. Mm-hmm. So you have to know like geometry, you got to have some physical acuity Physics, yeah. and all those stuff. And his thing is like, like when I hit the ball, I, I more or less know what it's going to do. It's not going to fly off the table, blah, blah, blah. All these, these things of probability. But you know, what Mayasu was saying is like, look, these laws of causality, I, my cause is the stroke of the, the pool cue hitting the ball. The effect is, you know, the geometrical path. And all of this could be explained. I might have put too much English on it, right? Too much spin. And so it doesn't go in the way I mean to, because a lot of it is because it's a game of skill, not a game of chance, right? right. I mean, you can miss Q and you're going right. to fuck up your points, but it's not a game of chance that the ball is going to fly off the table or even the billiard table itself is going to morph into, you know, a glass table and shatter or something like this, right? One of the main critiques of Hume is that the laws of probability that he's doing are, are of causality are applied to the balls on the table, but not the table itself, not the room in which the blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, up to the universe. Mm-hmm. I already mentioned the thing about the universe not being applicable to chance, but I think with what Bayesu does instead is say, what's interesting is Hume's skeptical thought experiment about causality is it comes down to our habits. It comes down to our sort of internal processes of, of limits of knowledge. And for Mayasu, it's not about our incapacities of thinking. The fact that laws of physics may change at any point without our becoming cognizant of it is not sort of based upon our abilities or lack thereof. What he'll want to say is that he'll want to have to talk about their relative stability. Why is it the fact that if, as he says, the laws of physics can be otherwise or hyper chaotic, why yeah. is it that they have a relative stability? Exactly. Um, Harmon brought this to bear as well. Yeah. But he was yeah. in his critique of uh, Thomas Nail more so, I think. Right. Getting and I th- sort of the same thing right here. And I think that for Mayasu, one of these forms of argumentation against his, his framework of the absence of reason for anything or any physical law is, is called a frequentialist argument, which is basically that there's a couple of forms of this. One form would be it would change so much, laws would change so much that we would, we would have noticed, right? If the laws of gravity changed, could change, they would change frequently enough for us to have noticed. Right. But Kant has a different way of thinking about this. And I think Kant's is actually more interesting and tries to solve, tries to say this is an impossibility for, for Kant. If 
for Kant's free equationalism is saying, if this were possible, if the laws of physics could change at any moment for no reason whatsoever, it would be so chaotic that living beings, thinking beings, consciousness itself could never have arisen out of it, out of this chaos. It would be yeah. mass disorder. Right. So Kant wants to say that that's not possible because we're obviously instantiated transcendental subjects and bodies. The fact that bodies have arisen at all proves that there has to be a kind of, this is what Mayasu calls metaphysics, right? That for Mayasu, metaphysics is the sort of assumption of necessary beings. Here, necessary physical laws, that they're necessarily stable. But for many of you, hyper chaos is so hyper that it's not just flux and becoming and disorder. It could be just as much hyper order, right? Just as much hyper fixity. Yeah. Just see the thing that really jumped out at me, maybe out of the whole work, aside from even more so than the critique of correlationism, is yeah, this idea that contingency means that not everything can happen. It goes against sort of a common sense, I think. I think bit. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is where it gets intricate and it's it's very interesting. But the way I try to think about it is, and this is why I mentioned the principle of non-contradiction, following as, as what he calls a figure of the principle of contingency or what he calls facticity, the principle of absolute, the only, you know, contingency being absolutely necessary is the fact that it's on the one hand, we can totally conceive and even discuss about contradictory things. We can talk about a squared circle. We can talk about even impossible things like golden mountains or something like this. We can talk about the current king of France is bald. Those statements have meaning or sense. And Deleuze works through this very beautifully in logic of sense. We can talk about those things. But for Mayasu, I think what he's trying to say is that the principle of non-contradiction is not about our limits of thinking. It's about beings themselves. Because if there were a contradictory being, it would be... It would um, negate itself automatically. It would negate itself at the same time. And simultaneity is, is important here. It's the simultaneity, I think that, that that's the problem because if it's kind of a corollary of the non-contradiction. If a being were simultaneously contradicting itself, it would be a necessary being. It would be kind of like a god. Yeah. Being. Now, doesn't this go a little bit towards the discussion with uh with chiesa right because what is the god or am i mixing up my words here the self-deceiving god the self-deceiving god okay yes i don't know yeah that's kind of what this reminds me of a little bit but a self-deceiving god isn't necessarily contradictory it would cause us to rethink our notion of god yeah because it wouldn't be a cartesian god right because a cartesian god is supposedly at least from descartes deductions neither uh, deceiving or self-deceiving in the concept of God is like, is like goodness. And in goodness is like that deceiving is bad and would therefore contradict the sort of the eternal goodness of God and, and God's protection, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Like only God could be all good and all evil or something like that. Am I fucking well, this up? <laughs> well, I think with Descartes, that would be foreclosed. God being God closed. could not be all good and all evil. Yeah. Simultaneous. Now, now, with someone like Maya Sue, what Maya Sue would articulate is that if, if Descartes were an atheist, mm -hmm. he would say, oh, it's totally conceivable that, that a god could be the evil genius that's deceiving me, which is why I can't trust my senses, blah, blah, blah. The mm -hmm. atheist would say, like, how can you believe in God when God allows all of these awful injustices to occur in the world? Right. That's one of the principal arguments from the atheist that, mm -hmm. that Maya Sue deals with. Well, yeah, because, you know, logically, God can't be all good. If he is all good, then he could not allow evil to occur, right? That, right. That's the argument. I don't recall which argument that is, but or if it right, even right. has a specific name. Because there's like what? There's like all the ontological argument, the cosmological, the I forget the fucking all the arguments. Right. <laughs> Might have right. to cut and that out, but no, 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 it's fine. I think that this is why you have this Manichaean dualism and separation of God and the devil, because you know, it becomes a, a difficult thing where it's God is omnipotent, and yet the devil is the source of of evil, mm -hmm. right? And temptation and sin, etc. Um, the fact that God allows the devil to even exist would be a contradiction if God is all good, right? Or it'd be within his power, 
to allow that, right? So it, it, this is I mean, where a lot way, of yeah, you could these are like the things. theological intricacies of the of the argument, and this is part of the interesting thing about Mayasu's God who does not yet exist, right? Because if God can exist in the future in this time of justice for all beings dead and to be or to be reborn, as he even phrases it in this hyper chaotic time, then God would not be the cause of evil in the world and therefore would not be dispersed in the way that the atheist thinks. You know, it's something interesting of this God that does not does not exist yet. What about something like Roko's Basilisk? I see what you mean. Right. It's a God that doesn't exist now it exists in the future but retroactively ex- mm-hmm. creates its own existence i don't know yeah it's- with the basilisk by not hastening what the future of generalized artificial intelligence we become able to be resurrected by the technological thinking machines that have become like gods resurrected and and submitted to eternal pain for not bringing their advent about right isn't it something like this that's the basilisk where we're kind of punished for not yeah for right. not helping in the creation of the hyper exactly uh, artificial intelligences yeah and i think that mayasu is a uh, god who does not yet exist is more benevolent than that right <laughs> uh, and not necessarily just technological right i think that's the key difference not that technology can't and doesn't form a mode of living and, and possibility, et cetera, in life now. It's more that that his argument is about the change in physical, biological laws, right, that would make even death itself non-necessary, which is kind of cool. I mean, it still has some of this, this kind of religious right. opium overtones <laughs> for it, but I yeah. respect the commitment to following his premises to this seemingly fantastical conclusions. I mean, does that not feel sort of aligned with this kind of, I don't know, techno singularity idea just to maybe like slightly divert from Roko's basilisk without, I don't know, not deviating too terribly. There's a matrix kind of element to Roko's basilisk, although in the hypothesis of the basilisk versus the matrix, instead of being sort of in this hedonic, state you know where you have stake and women in red you're just being tortured with the basilisk we're, we're thinking of hell in the future being realized through technological means and i think that there's a sense in which it's a non-religious heaven for mayasu well i think well i it's guess the heaven I mean, of, more so heaven of, like yeah you know the techno technical singularity in a in a positive sense of like if we become like these uh fantastic creatures of artificial intelligence that no longer have biological bodies or even bodies uh, yeah. at all. And we just sort of exist as pure energy or whatever. Mm-hmm. If we do have some type of a body or, you know, I don't know. In the cloud. Right. Yeah. I think that's one technological science fiction way of thinking through more concretely what Mayasu was talking about. And I think that what's difficult or why his speculative materialism forecloses those more obviously more interesting stories is Mm -hmm. the fact that it is completely based on contingency and so doesn't need to have rational i say rational but doesn't need to have a kind of condition of possibility say that the singularity or something else to explain it i think that that's part of the hope if you will for this realm of justice this ultimate realm that he's hmm. talking about that obviously has kind of theological aspects that he wants right, to also right. kind of cut off. But we can definitely think through a technological genesis of that of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm also thinking about, I don't know if this is even germane or not, but I think it sort of is in the realm of it is like the way that Ligotti talks about these higher dimensional beings that they create a universe is a process to generate their children because they exist outside of time and nothing outside of time can change. Only things within a universe with time can change and grow. And then eventually that universe can become this thing that exists outside of time. That's the sort of end state of this process is these extra dimensional beings. It's Lovecraftian monstrosity, right. breeding yeah. ground. Right. Yeah. I think that the thing with Mayasu is like, well, that gives a, a reason for being 
that postulates the exactly is, what Azathoth and yeah, it would still be falling back into a, sort of like a would that be a a different type of correlationism? Not necessarily, but it would be postulating a necessary being as a cause, right? As a yeah, like a first, as a, or whatever, yeah, as like a as, as like a first cause, yeah, right. But again, that's part of the fun, right? Of these, yeah, yeah, fantastical. You know, instead of thinking of a benevolent god that we've sort of always had, which is kind of boring for a monotheism, it is more interesting, if not terrifying, to think <laughs> of, to think speculatively of these absolute beings that are outside space and time, and and sort of. Uh, infiltrating with their little tendrils and i think this is why graham Harmon has that cool book on lovecraft cthulhu so yeah. or because lovecraft sorry cthulhu being one of the incarnations of that speculative realism and um and fiction and especially horror fiction you can see how easy it is to like delve into that i mean even schraber too i mean I always make that kind of connection to schraber when it comes to these discussions of divinity and, yeah. and lovecraft because i feel like there was some type of Schraber's God is kind of a Lovecraftian yeah, exactly. demonic. For, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Except, because, I mean, yeah. What's interesting, too, is if we go back to this question of the phenomenal, this dialectic of the phenomenal and the noumenal and God and Schraber's God in particular. And that, you know, point that I always like to bring up is that Schraber's God doesn't understand the living. Yes. We could maybe draw that out in terms of this dialectic between noumenal, phenomenal, because this is part of a lot of what Mayasu is sort of getting at too relative to knowledge and thought and and access to knowledge and discussions of science etc right there is this interesting thing where for schraber there's this inversion where living beings are noumenal to a certain extent to god right it reminds me a little bit of kind of like (laughs) yeah god can never know the Living thing in itself. The living that's in itself. Funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's kind of interesting too, and it, it kind of reminds me of another perversion, if you will, of like 18th century deism, where God sets everything up the way He wants. He He puts a principle of sufficient reason for everything to work the way it should, mm-hmm. and then steps back. He's the transcendent cause, but he he kind of escapes the signifying chain, like like the phallus, right? So so to speak, he sort of removes himself from the the chain and lets lets it work like a clock. I think that there's something similar to that where this perverse God, obviously Straber's God is hyper perverse, you know, is God creates contingency and then lets contingency be the absolute. But that still puts a, puts right. a reason for that. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's, yeah, that's exactly. A, but it is interesting that, you know, that the perversion that Straber's God has is, is, sort of constant almost like a vampire like constantly sucking schraber's life force and just this and like demiraculate what eating away at schraber's body for enjoyment but at the same time recomposing it as it's dissolving right there's this really interesting symbiotic you know god is almost this parasite of schraber god is this you know sucking his life for he's like a vampire schraber's job is to provide constant enjoyment to this god again to bring up the matrix kind of like he's he's a little battery right in right a, in a pod i mean christ himself too like this kind of is interesting right because god god must become he's all mortal and he's all god or is he is he fully mortal this is part of the reason for the non-contradiction principle that Bayesu derives as a figure for, of contingency because a necessary being like god say the christian god is both immortal immaterial otherworldly yet mortal man interworldly in order to save the world from itself leto too right he's all god all well he's not all god because he is mortal yes but he he sort of has a fin he has a finitude i guess <laughs> leave, leave that aside again it makes sense that we're, we're, we're sort of yeah using i mean just another way to look at these kind of beings that this discussion i think you know brings into question more so yeah it again exemplifies how science fiction and fantasy, speculative fiction and yeah, speculative right? and speculative fiction speculative realism can have these really fun dynamics yeah here's that line i mentioned earlier put otherwise it is because everything must be contingent that everything cannot be possible that's such a banger to me that might have been the most exciting thing from the whole the whole reading for me <laughs>
He says right above that, the necessity of contingency implies the impossibility of contradiction. And here he means contradiction of things, right? Because as we said, we can discuss contradictory things, but then real contradiction is what he'll call it, right? Yeah. Real contradiction is for him excluded because that would create a necessary being. So it implies the impossibility of contradiction or of the whole. And again, if there were a whole, I think God is the quintessential like hallmark for this contradictory necessary being, but also for the unity of the universe, right? If there were a whole, then the universe could be totalized. If it could be totalized, then it could be submitted to the laws of probability, which would then give us back to Kant's reasoning about the reason why physical laws have to remain stable and be what they are and not be otherwise. Because then you wouldn't have bodies, you wouldn't have consistency. Mm -hmm. And I think a plane of consistency. Yeah, you wouldn't have nothing could cohere. There would only be chaos. And Mayasu is saying, no, that's can't apply the role of the dice to this whole that would be the universe because the universe is not totalized. Which gets us to the Lacan shit that you brought up earlier and Chiesa and uh, incompleteness, right? I think that's part of the argument too. There's not this set of all sets to which we can we can kind of have completeness and wholeness and symmetry and all of this mm -hmm. that is forbidden. Mayasu talks about well, he I guess he goes about this in a few different ways relative to like critiques of correlationism. Mm -hmm. One of which I think kind of this idea of like a speculative idealism that if I'm not mistaken, he would sort of would perhaps characterize someone like Deleuze? It's hard to say if that is who he's thinking of. He would definitely... I mean, put... he does think Deleuze is a, falls into the trap of correlationism, right? I mean, that's arguable, but... His beef with Deleuze is very nuanced. Yeah. And it has to do with May or May, May, or May and, <laughs> uh, and the dice throw that we were just talking about. That's kind of its own thing. And I think that... To a certain extent, what he disagrees with Deleuze on is, and I don't know if I, if I find this convincing, but it's interesting, yeah. that Deleuze, Nietzsche, maybe even Heraclitus to a certain extent, they all think of becoming, but their becoming is still tied to a kind of principle of reason. Now, this is a huge thing that would take a whole episode to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> but gotcha. but I think that for Mayasu, becoming can't have a principle of reason due to hyper chaos, due to what he even calls super contingency, which is the fact that contingency is not contingent, it's absolute, as we've already said. His thing would be that becoming has no principle of reason, just like anything else. And becoming is also contingent and can change. In hyper chaos, there can just as be hyper becoming as hyper fixity. This is part of his disagreement with Deleuze on at least, let's say, the way becoming becomes kind of central in A Thousand Plateaus, for example, right? So I think in that sense, he would say, yes, Deleuze says he's a metaphysician, as we talked about with John mm -hmm. Rove. But he's a metaphysician for reasons that he doesn't, that he doesn't perhaps know, or that he doesn't think through. Because for Deleuze, metaphysicians are thinkers of being qua being, right? Which is why he's thinking through the, the university of being. He's thinking through, you know, the whole principle of difference having its own concept and not being tied to identity, you know, the eternal return as the return of, of difference, blah, blah, blah. I think for Mayasu, his way of thinking of metaphysics is, is the assumption of, of necessary beings. So becoming necessarily being one way rather than another and having a sort of principle of reason that I think is what Mayasu would say he's he's a metaphysician but whether or not uh, Deleuze falls into an idealism you know that's that's possible too I mean Thomas Nail has some interesting things about this when Deleuze is talking about the image of thought and whatnot mm -hmm. but in any case I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head the best way to I know that Anna Longo has a good essay on Mayasu and Deleuze uh, in the, the time, was it Time Without Becoming, something like that? Or Without Being, I can't remember. One or the other. Yeah, so that, I would have to turn to that essay to see a good way of, uh, of isolating the differences. I know that, that 
the way she tries to say it is that Deleuze's transcendental empiricism versus Mesu's speculative materialism, and that Deleuze ends up in what she calls a subjectalist type of modality. Yeah. That was all I was able to read for today. So we'll just leave that up in the air. But obviously, Mayasu being a student of Badu, he's going to in- have inherited certain, <laughs> yeah, true, right? Certain, uh, I won't call them prejudices, but certain misgivings, certain yeah. um, cautions when it comes with the lows. Yeah, maybe we can back up and just discuss. I guess so. For me, and it's funny because this even goes back to like right around the time that speculative realism is sort of getting off the ground. Is when I'm like ask, or right around that period is when I was asking myself how does philosophy move forward beyond post-structuralism? Because one of the key generic overall points, I mean, it's hard to, I guess one of the key, you know, questions or things that even though that disparate group of thinkers comes up with is like the centrality of sort of, I guess the primacy of, well, maybe that's falling into structuralism a bit, (laughs) but I guess uh, let me try to think this through. So it'd be something like, we can only access or we can only acquire knowledge of the world through our subjective phenomenological experience. Language is part of that. I don't know exactly how to situate language in there, but language is sort of our access to the phenomenal. And it's maybe- part of our intersubjective community of access, right? It gets us out of our solipsism, blah, blah, blah. And it's like the question is, do does language shape the object or does language shape the phenomenological experience of the object or whatever? Whatever it's like our phenomenological perception of an object's qualities, does that arise from the object itself or does that arise through our like prism of language that we're embedded within? Let's maybe tackle this and then we can get... If you think this is relevant, because I think no, yeah, no, no. this, no, this kind of like builds into correlation. This or... builds into the correlation. Yes, okay, exactly. Cool. Right, so I, I was thinking about how there is a kind of... Let me just say that this would be like, my position is, yeah, we, we can only know, our only access to the, real, to the real is through our sort of biological, you know, phenomenological, whatever um, experience of it. We can sort of think about the world being different. But there's no ne- there's like n- not necessarily a link between the real and our perception of the real, I guess would be a better way to say it, right? It's possible that there could correlate our perception of the world could correlate to the or the real could correlate to what how it really is, but we will not know. So there it's almost like an agnosticism towards yeah. the real, right? I think that has historically been my my gotcha. position, I would say, which is I think a correlation it's a correlationism right because it's dealing with this gap or this dialectic of the phenomenal and the noumenal i would say that the way that you're describing it and bringing in the real and it being foreclosed to thought or in foreclosed to symbolization or whatever i think everything you said makes perfect sense and that makes a lot of sense the way you're dealing with in the other sense in the sense in which language and culture mediates our like say perception of objects right. yeah yeah That would be get us on the realm of the imaginary. And I do think that it has, it's metastable and it also has effects both ways, right? Because I'm thinking of like Alaskan natives have hundred words for for white, right? Because that their milieu and the and so they become very sensitive to the gradations of of whiteness due to the the snowy and milieu. Right. The real is making a determinative. And this could go back to like we were talking about with the machine and structure with Guattari and the voice. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's kind of the same relation, right? Is the, I don't remember it enough to like. But see, I don't know. I don't know how the real would work there. What I was trying to say, I guess, was that the, due to the, the imaginary surroundings, right? The surroundings of the images that are daily, every day, they become subsumed into culture in such a way that they're symbolized. And differentiated almost infinitesimally in ways that, mm-hmm. that like we wouldn't be used to, as opposed to like the ancient Greeks who, due to either something in their diet or maybe something in their genetic disposition, they mm-hmm. saw the ocean as wine dark, as purple, rather than as, say, blue. You could see how culture is like this mediate language and culture right. 
or like in this meeting feedback with perceptual yeah. with the imaginary dimension you set us up perfectly because that gets us into this question of the real what the correlation says as i mentioned earlier is it's about this it's what graham harman calls the philosophy of access correlationism mm -hmm. and it's about this almost conundrum or paradox where one of the examples Mayasu gives and i know this is I'm going to start with something weird and we'll get to the everyday is what is it to think of my death? I can obviously think of my death, but insofar as I'm thinking of my death, I am thinking it. And so therefore I persist. And there is this, this speculative void, if you will, for the correlationist where you could say, I, I can't know what it's like to be dead, but I can, think of it insofar as I'm alive. And so it is unknowable, but potentially thinkable as an abstraction. And I think that this, what Mayasu starts with though, is with science. How is it that science, modern science, with radioactive isotopes, with, with stellar luminescence, is able to roughly date the age of the universe at 15 billion years, the accretion of the earth at 4.5 billion years, et cetera. What are the meaning of those statements yeah. for someone like a correlationist? Mm -hmm. And we won't get into the different varieties and, you know, the subjective idealist or the strong and weak. Yeah, the strong. We can, we can do away with that for now. That gets us into deeper territory. But for the most part, you know, May is saying, well, the correlationists would say, OK, those truths that the scientists claim to have are not what they appear, what they seem to be. So the correlationist will say to the scientist, those truths may have like a kind of relative truth, but they don't have the truth you think they do. You're stating facts about what could potentially be, be true if there were a consciousness around to perceive it. And so what Mayasu is kind of ridiculing or starting with the core correlationist is saying, by saying this, by making consciousness thinking the necessary foundation for accessing being, you are making nonsense out of what science is doing. You're calling science a naive realist, but you're, you're saying that that's the sort of the things they're describing is impossible or doesn't have the meaning we think we do. And so what Mayasu says is actually what the correlationist does is say that before the advent of life or consciousness or whatever, it's as though the time of those events had not passed and it took till consciousness to think them. And so it's in the present that we think a past that's never been passed, but has only passed for my present consciousness. And so there's this retrojection, you know, of consciousness back, or it's sort of a making present of a time that was never present. Obviously, none of that makes sense. That's not what science is saying. It's not what science is doing. And this gets us kind of, again, with like the way that Graham Harmon, what I appreciated about his work is that it puts the human back into the center of everything. Mm -hmm. It says there is actually no in itself that can be described by like mathematics or whatever, or by the ancestral statements of science. Mm -hmm. It's always for us, right? That these ancestral statements are only true for us in this mediated present which mm -hmm. is how Kant would think it, or in this inner subjective community of scientists, which is how Husserl would think it. But again, that would that has problems with it. And for uh, Mayasu, the ancestral is problematic for the correlationist because even if you assume, as Kant does, a transcendental subject, that still requires a body to instantiate itself in. Mm -hmm. So to high, to retroject a, a subject back, a consciousness back that could see you know, the beginnings of the universe or the accretion of the earth or whatever, that doesn't work. That itself is a flight of fancy and a kind of perverse torsion. More mundanely put, if a tree falls in the wood and no one's around to observe it, does it make a sound, right? That we've all, I think that's getting at the same thing, right? What May Sue would say about that is that that, could, that would be perhaps what the correlationists would say is that bringing up the Zen paradox, right? Mm -hmm. No, There isn't a Zerber around. Does it make a sound? And we assume sounds are only sounds insofar as they correlate with the consciousness to perceive them, right? But what Mayasu is saying is like, no, this isn't a sort of gap in perception. This is a gap, a lacuna 
before any perception was possible, right? Any consciousness was possible, any language, any science, any, uh, any life at all. Mm -hmm. That's why it's, it's the ancestral and not the ancient or not the, the remote. If you want to, if you want to think of the tree falling in the forest and no one around to observe it, that's like a remote perception that could obviously happen if there were a human there, Mm -hmm. but the ancestral doesn't put itself that way, right? It It is a gap that can't be bridged. It's a gap that could not have had life around, subjects around, consciousness around. And yet the statements the science produces about these events have a meaning, a precise meaning. Mm-hmm. And they don't have to be correlated with the consciousness, which is why he considers them, and he considers mathematics specifically, even though he has to write another book to really <laughs> make this concrete, even though I think that the one can intuitively at least see why mathematics would be a discourse about the in itself that does not require the the possibility of discourse about the events or the possibility of consciousness about those events, right? It doesn't require that mediation for us to describe, if that makes sense, right? Hmm. This just makes me think about the knowledge that science produces is sort of has its own contingency, I guess, is how I would look at the knowledge that is produced. Like this replicable outcomes that science can produce are contingent upon this particular whatever imminent reality or some shit like that. That's true. That's I would say they're, they're contingent in two ways, right? Uh, in related ways, if you will. They're contingent upon the stability of the, the natural physical laws that Mayus was talking about in hyperchaos, right? Which, which as far as we know, haven't changed in the past few centuries, but that's still like a blink of the eye in 15 billion years or in the infinity of time, whatever you want to say. Uh, but the other way they're contingent in a different way, maybe it's not the right word, is there we cannot predict the future hypotheses that will call into question science's own rough estimations and, and graspings for knowledge and truth, right? We to talk about is falsifiability or new procedures for verification, new procedures for new instruments for fine-tuning our knowledge. So in that sense, knowledge is at least, it's obviously not absolute or stable. It, it's subject to revision and to uh, right. refinement, but that wouldn't necessarily be a good way to, that might conflate contingency in that sense, but it would be, but still the statements today, even if we can fine tune the exact date of the universe, and even if there have been, I know in the late nineties, there were some controversies about astronomical evidence about the dating of the universe and the oldest stars and the oldest stars being older than the relative date of the universe. So there's, so obviously we still have some shit to get in order, but the fact remains that what May is is trying to point out to the correlationism and why correlationism is so dangerous is that it threatens the legitimacy and autonomy of scientific statements and their meaning. And it renders them fucking absurd and, and jeopardizes their whole enterprise. So I think this is part of why, like Laura Well, for example, in a lot of his writings, he'll point out how philosophy for a long time has sort of tried to encroach upon science and even tried to become a science because it isn't one. And so has has, has always tried to promote metaphysics as the queen of the sciences as Kant did, or to say there's a crisis in the sciences like uh, Husserl and Heidegger did and say, like, you need a phenomenology to ground it. Right, Laura Well has always been suspect of philosophy's way of trying to come in and save science from its naivete or whatever. And I think Mayasu is trying to do something similar here by showing correlationism to be one of the main threats in that aspect. Does it make sense to talk about philosophical decision here? Because I think, right, it does have some relevance, maybe not in this particular juncture in the conversation, but to this piece a little bit or... Am, am I off base? I think to a certain extent, if we use it loosely, correlationism is a kind of philosophical decision to put the human and thought at the center of everything, including mm-hmm. being. And this comes down to Parmenides, thinking and being are the same. This is one of the sort of the oldest metaphysical pronouncements. And Mayasu is trying to say that, that no, they are actually radically differentiated. 
they have to be. Otherwise, we get back into uh, hypostatizing the, the correlation and making it the unsurpassable limits of thought, and therefore putting the subject back into the center. He calls it a, an anti-Copernican revolution that Kant institutes with this transcendental idealism. It's a Ptolemaic counter-revolution is what he calls it. By putting the subject back into the middle of everything and infecting the correlation with everything, it reinstitutes the, the human or thought itself as sort of the, the center and the mediator for all things. And, and may you say like, no, science cannot function if that's true. Science cannot function if the human and the human perception is the center of all being. Yes. And if it mediates all being, if it mediates all being, yeah, that's a better way to, okay. Cause then we would say that, no, we can't describe the reality of ancestral statements or use mathematical or, you know, dating techniques or whatever, and produce mathematical statements about sort of the facts of things that pre-existed humans, life consciousness, that if the correlation is, or the subject infects everything, then those statements are put into jeopardy and mathematics along the way is relativized and becomes a discourse like any other discourse. It becomes just a like a discourse of mediation, like language, culture, etc. And I think that's what Mayasu is also trying to, I mean, Badu's doing something similar. He says he has different problems, but it's trying to show how mathematics alone can us a means of discoursing about what there is when there is no thought, if you want to say that right? Prior to or after humanity's existence, how could we even have a discord sort of uh, doing some sort of language game bullshit or some sort of fantasy or some sort of uh, mental exercise, intellectual masturbation? How can we try to produce true statements or statements of knowledge if we don't have a type of discourse that isn't sort of infected and relativized by the correlation, by language, blah, blah, blah. Again, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with everything Macy's is doing, but I do think that his pinpoints a precise enemy and, and has some, some laudable goals. We basically, I think, articulated this already, but this is another thing I found quite interesting was what he describes as this double impasse between realism and anti-realism falling prey to this destruction of science that you just kind of went over. Maybe I should read this bit of the text because I think it'll go towards that, okay. what you just kind of elucidated. Henceforth, we can more precisely formulate what we mean by the antimony of ancestrality, namely the double impasse into which we appear to be falling. Every realism is immediately destroyed by the pragmatic contradiction that it inevitably seems to include. But on the other hand, every anti-realism seems to imply a destruction of the meaning of science insofar as science brings us to discover an ancestral temporality that becomes somewhat demented in the light of correlationism. This is the antimony that we shall work to deepen and resolve. Okay, so yeah. this is more so, I think, drawing distinctions between, I guess, the weaknesses of this double impasse. Let's see, every, every realism is immediately destroyed by the pragmatic contradiction. I forget yeah. the examples that he uses to. Yeah, let's look at that text. And illustrate. You can, can illustrate. You can. Uh, let, me, let me bring the text up. Because I think that it has to do with non contradiction. Yeah, he says uh, the difficulty we have encountered due to this simple question, right, which is about the reality of scientific experimentation that's not myth, storytelling, or just fantasy that actually mm -hmm. makes ancestral statements. So the difficulty we have encountered comes from engaging the ancestral bearing of modern science and the dominant anti-realism of modern philosophy. If metaphysical materialism seems basically untenable after Berkeley, and if every form of realist dogmatism, including Berkeley's immaterialism, seems to be discredited after Hume, then it is perhaps for a reason as simple as it is decisive. The realist, in fact, always seems to commit a pragmatic contradiction when she claims to know a reality independent from her thought because the reality of which she speaks is precisely what she is given to think, which is the pragmatic contradiction then is the realist trying to think what there is without thought through thinking, right? That's the, pra <laughs> that's the pragmatic contradiction. He continues, when I claim to access a thing in itself, I have really accessed nothing but a given from which I cannot extract that it is strictly correlated with the access that I have to it and that it has no conceivable meaning outside this access in whichever way I may conceive it. In this sense, it seems empty to ask what things are when no one is there to perceive them. Now, he's setting up here. He doesn't believe that last part, but he's setting up the contradiction. 
and saying that we always fall into this contradiction of realism if the correlationist is not defeated on their own grounds, if we simply ignore them or simply dismiss them, then there will always persist this pragmatic contradiction of what it means to think, to think a reality independent from thinking. And that jeopardizes the ancestral statements of science. What comes to mind here is the myth of the given uh-huh. and I guess everything being fashioned by, by us. Upon reading that, the myth of the given seemed to clash a bit with the way that he talks about ancestrality, or maybe I'm just misreading it and they're copacetic. Well, I think that the, the given for Mayasu is Heidegger's Es gibt das Sein, which is like being is, which is being is literally is given. And I think even Heidegger struggles with this and his like, he has this interesting correspondence with, with someone in the thirties where he's kind of saying like, like what would reality be if it weren't searching forth towards a humanity to like actualize its potential. So even Heidegger is kind of taking seriously. So that, that's the, the onto theological. Well, the, to a certain extent, yeah. Cause except that I think here he's really actually grappling with Mayasu's problem of ancestrality or of this non-correlational givenness. But he's kind of saying, like, does it make sense at all for there not for there not to be a humanity or thinking subjects, right? Wouldn't nature be kind of like incomplete or not reaching its higher power? It's almost a Schillingian type of of teleology, if you will. But anyway, I'm sorry about that. I, I guess what I'm saying is like I think Mayasu is trying to think in his own terms, what Laura Will is calling the given without givenness, mm-hmm. right? That there is that given the givenness or the given would be given to a subject. And when we make ancestral statements about what preceded life, we're making statements about what preceded givenness. There was nothing to give to, right? Does that make sense? So I think that last part, but I don't understand. Well, if there if there is no if there is no thought around to think, say the expansion of the universe after the Big Bang, if even that could be considered, you know, if there is no, you know, say the Big Bang would be the given. If there is no givenness, there is there is nothing to give insofar as there's no subject, there's no correlation, right? Mm -hmm. There's no subject to witness the accretion of the Earth 4.5 billion years ago. So the correlationist wants wants to say that it is given when science thinks it in the present and thinks and mediates this time lapse. And that's when it's given. That's when the givenness happens. But that, again, to make science absurd, that's again to make the statements it's making convoluted and to make it always say, I can think the in itself for us. And Mayasu's not happy with that. He doesn't want that for us. That's the givenness, right? He's saying mathematical, scientific experimentation, et cetera. When it discourses about these ancestral events, it's not discoursing about for us. That's not the type of attempt it's doing. So for us would be the correlation. So this is a move away from anthropocentrism. Yeah, I think so. And maybe that's the big move, right? As opposed to, I guess, the kind of like I was sort of trying to argue with Mm post-structuralism. Yeah, it's a move away from anthropocentrism. It's a move away from noocentrism, if you want to call it that, right? The centrism of thought as though... Uh, Yeah, yeah. Because you could do this in a number of ways. You could say, well, God was always there to perceive it. That's one way to do it. That's a kind of religious, even a quasi-metaphysical way of doing it, that there there was some... Well, who was around? There was the the God. There was this transcendent subject to perceive the unfolding of the events, to Uh guarantee them. But again, that's making a necessary being. That's part of the combined, the conjoined targets for attacking correlationism and making contingency absolute because that means there's no necessary being because you could easily the correlationist if she had a religious penchant she could say oh well there was there was always a god around to see it whether this god be a christian god or just a metaphysical god a sort of sort of god is love universe free floating whatever right it would reintroduce transcendence this gets back to the way you kind of beautifully formulated it, that this absoluteness of contingency is imminence, is an imminent principle. Does it make sense to move on to this hyper-chaos out 
out of um, correlationism? Yeah, I think so. I think we could talk about hyperchaos a little bit more. Uh, he he later says he prefers to call it hyper or super contingency, but I think hyper chaos sounds cooler. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it sounds like a Guattari a little bit something kind of come yeah. up with, right? Chaosmosis, uh, chaosophy, yeah. chaosophy. <laughs> what I mean, the the term that Mayasu comes up with is, is eschaology, which is obviously a punning on eschatology, but replacing the eschaton, which is the sort of the end, right. the end times, with chaos. Because eschatology implies a beginning and an alpha and omega, a first a beginning and an end, a necessary telos. And in hyperchaos, there is no necessary eventuality of any one thing being what it is or not being, etc. Do you want to read a, one, of, one of the quotes? The question from which we left off is the following. Can we give a precise reason to the fact that a universally contradictory entity i.e. an entity that would simultaneously render all conceivable propositions and their negation true to the fact, as we say, that such an entity cannot exist, can we ground in reason or certainty that such an inconsistent being is a sheer ontological chimera? It is by responding to this questioning that I have elaborated the idea of derivation, for it seemed to me that a precise answer could be given to this strange question, and this answer would be the following. An inconsistent, universally contradictory being is impossible because this being would stop being able to be contingent. Uh, <laughs> uh, we already kind of talked about that, though, I think. No, no, I mean, it's, it's good. It, um, it reminds me of the way Simon Dunn talks about individuation and the impossibility of an absolute being. An absolute being would be a kind of perfect being. And for him, this is ethically impossible. It would not require a pre-individual milieu from which to annex and feed off of, to grow and change and whatever. It would be self-sufficient. He has kind of argumentation that's very similar to May Sue in arguing for the impossibility of an absolute being. He doesn't use the word God there, but that's potentially what he means. Right. But he also talks about what he calls the wild demented act, which would be an act that, that acted as though it were not concatenated and connected to all of the other infinite chain of acts, it would be this, he calls it, it would be the perfect act. Now, what he means by this is not that it would be good, morally good. What he means by perfect act is that it would be self-enclosed and self-sufficient. And that for him is why it's impossible, why it would not be a moral act. It would take it as an end in itself. It's almost quasi-Kantian in a certain sense, except that it's, he's thinking in terms of less in terms of means and ends and more in terms of sort of this impossibility of a self-sufficiency. And that's why I, I kind of think of Laura Well in the critique of the principle of philosophical sufficiency to, to bring us back to the philosophical de- decision stuff. There's a sense in which there's a, there's a sufficiency in deciding that the correlation is the only absolute, for example, which is one of the forms of correlationism that everything that we think has to be correlated with the thinking subject. Here's an interesting thing, I think, to get back to science. No, this even would go back to like Platonism too, would be or idealism, transcendental idealism is distinguishing between what science is doing. Is science discovering knowledge or is science generating knowledge about the real or or whatever, or reality, or I don't know, the noumenal, maybe? Right. Because wouldn't the Platonic position would be knowledge is uncovered, knowledge is discovered, knowledge is a priori out there, and then we uncover it versus we generate it imminently. And that would be tied to like this myth of the given more so. Yeah, this question of knowledge. Or I guess the reverse, right? So like the idealist position would be that knowledge is given, it exists a priori outside of us regardless of whether there are subjects around to uncover that knowledge. I don't know. I think this is an interesting question relative to this, but I don't know, maybe you can, am I wrong or what do you? I guess it would, it would come down to this definition of knowledge and. Yeah. Let's ask, okay, what, what is science producing then just as a general question? Like what does science produce? Gosh, I mean, this even does it is... produce facticity? Does it produce facts about the noumenal or the well, real or 
what is it right. producing exactly? Right. It, it wouldn't produce facticity because facticity is contingency. Uh, now, I think that Mesu would say that it would produce perhaps description of facts, right? It would produce a knowledge in that if, if one took knowledge in a simple sense as a description of facts, because I do think that Mayasu has this way of describing the ancestral as, or even the contingency of beings as facts. It's just that contingency itself is not a fact because he, he doesn't want to redouble it because redoubling it would cause it to be, a, would cause it to sort of itself be contingent and therefore allow for a necessary being, blah, blah, blah. I think facts are, are for Mayasu potentially out in the world. Now, knowledge already being out in the world, I think I'm not so sure how he would describe that because I'm leaning, well, we more, can... I'm leaning more towards science producing knowledge that perhaps knowledge of the endeavors of science. Not to say the facts don't exist out there and before us, but that knowledge itself would be a human endeavor. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's, that's a fine distinction to make, but I don't yeah. know what that distinction is really achieving or doing. It seems uh, like it's just a semantics. Well, uh, yeah, I, and I, I think that uh, it's it's the question of knowledge. Seems like it is an endeavor of of uh, a subject or, of right, ordering facts fact. or arranging them. Uh, okay, you know what I'm saying. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it would be a part of, and knowledge can change. We know that, right? What we consider. Even ancient knowledge can fall out of favor and, and be rediscovered as having all kinds of uh, unexpected effects. We can right, think about true. the hexadecimal system of the ancient Sumerians having applications for algorithms. Michel Serre is very good about this interesting temporality of knowledge, but we can also think about... Anyway, that, that's my point, I guess, is that knowledge can, can change and transform and be submitted to this continual refinement and this is why I think Leotard says something interesting about science doesn't produce knowledge. It produces a series of effects, which I think is kind of interesting way to put it. But wouldn't Leotard himself fall into the trap of the correlation? Maybe that's too broad of a question for us. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe food for thought. I'm not sure. I think perhaps... Would he not fall into this subjectivist position? I think it's very possible. It's hard to tell. And we would have to distinguish evil Leotard from, <laughs> from the later yeah. Leotard. What I meant by science produces a, a series of effects is that, the, that I think what's nice about this is that it dynamizes knowledge instead of it being the stable thing that's like solidified right. for once and all. It has, it has this mobility and it produces effects. I think for the most part, that doesn't do any disservice to what Mayasu was talking about Yeah, with ancestral statements. So it sounds like facts in this, from this position would be, are facts a priori then? Or are they imminent? Because they would be contingent. They would be contingent facts, Yeah, right? Yeah. Ultimately. I think a priori is difficult here because Kant, when he means a priori, he means before experience, right? Things that are that sort of, sort of inhere in things, right? So Maybe transcendental would be the better, or facts transcendental. I think, I think, I think here what I would say is that facts don't require subjectivity or or thinking or life or whatever to subsist. Whether or not they persist is different, right? Because as as uh, Mayasu says, there's no reason for a fact to be than to be otherwise or not to be. So that's absoluteness of contingency. But there's no need for a subject in the present to produce ancestral statements using dating technology for that to become a fact. So maybe that's that's where we got into this discovery question, right? That you brought up. Yeah. This this act of discovery itself doesn't make the fact a fact. I think for Mayasu. Facts don't care about our feelings. <laughs> they don't care about our subjectivity. They don't care about our thought. If you if you see what I'm saying? I mean totally I get that makes sense because I don't know. The only way I can I just have a hard time not thinking of that as a transcendental, a transcendental necessity or whatever, because the certain facts have to be true in order for subjects to exist as well, right? Or certain facts have to be contingently true, I should say. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's that's probably true. To the same extent, there could be universes we can easily conceive of universes that never gave rise to life. Even to matter, I mean, this is Mayasu's 
interesting hypothesis. I mean, right. we can, well, I think it's interesting that, you know, just to go back to Herman, that he even like questions the ex- like matter, you know, I'm, I'm open to that. Yeah. Idea. Yeah. 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 And I, and I didn't mean to bring up that because that does get us back into a philosophical speculation, but, but just in a broad sense, gotcha. um, you know, uh, can we imagine, you know, black hole universes or something equivalent that allow for no consistency whatsoever mm-hmm. in this hyper chaotic time? So, yeah, but you're right. There had to have been a, and we can only see this retroactively, but that doesn't make it necessary. There had to have been a series of contingent facts for a world to consist in such a way as to give rise to life and to give rise to thought, to give rise to humans. Right. And there was no necessary reason for it to have happened the way it did. Right. I think that this is interesting because it gets us into dialogue about something we talked about with Anti Oedipus, right? When when they start chapter three of Anti Oedipus and they're saying like we gotta follow Marx's kind of rules of historical engagement to the letter and know that the history of capitals especially is it's contingent, contingent yeah. ironic, critical, retrospective, that things did not have to line up the way they did to produce capitalism. Right. Yeah. And that it took a whole series of monstrous conjunctions and encounters for, for that to become possible, which is why they keep asking, why didn't it happen in 14th century China? There was, there was definitely that possibility. The flows were conjoining. All the, the conditions of possibility were there. But the state shut down the mines when they reached a quota instead of pushing for sort of endless surplus extraction. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely fuck with, I guess, radical contingency. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that I've had a, a certain, that's been my position, I think. Yeah, I think if you don't have that idea, what we're talking about, which you formulated very nicely, that there had to have been a series of facts contingently coming to be for there to be a world at all. I think that that is, it's both anti-metaphysical or non-metaphysical in, in Mayasu's strict sense, right? Because it doesn't posit any necessary beings. And it's also irreligious right it's non-religious or anti-religious because it doesn't start with a sort of benevolent god or a god that's sort of guiding right it doesn't start with this teleology or this right. onto theology that's going to guarantee the production of matter life thought it's interesting how contingency i guess it is sort of tied to this hyper chaos right of i don't know it's interesting that like i said earlier the uh this point about how contingency rules out some possibilities i think it's just that's a fascinating argument just to go back to that yeah he doesn't give a lot of examples of it but the main one would be the contradictory being contradictory being would be a necessary being and a necessary being would rule out the absoluteness of contingency that's his main point one would think okay contingency sort of means that there's more there is a flux but it's almost like Contingency is its own type of determinism in a sense. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's the, well. Or chaos or hyper chaos. I wouldn't say determinism, but it is a, it is a determination, Mm -hmm. right? It's a determinate indeterminacy. Yeah, it's a determinate indeterminism. (laughs) So it's, it it is its own, there's the contradiction. (laughs) Right. <laughs> well, no, not necessarily, right? Because a determinism would would bring us back to necessary beings, right? And would bring us back to this kind of hardline causality that he's trying to... It would bring us back to a... Because I think with determinism, you, you fall back into saying there are reasons behind the reasons for everything to be the way it is instead of other Well, he, and contingen- is, contingency is the reason or could be argued as the reason though, right? But, it, but contingency itself is the absence of reason, right? It's saying that, that that's not a stupid thing to ask, right? To, to, or that's not a, the way he puts it. I really love this. I think this was in the piece we wrote today. It almost seems childlike, but it's beautiful. When people ask why are things the way they are rather than otherwise, the reason given should be taken seriously that for no reason whatsoever. That should be taken as a serious answer. And he means that, you know? Um, you can kind of think of the, the adult answering the child. The child's wanting an infinite regress or an infinite series of answers for why the sky is blue, et cetera, or why they have to go to bed at a certain time. And, and eventually the, the parent says, because I said so, 
but that's still giving a reason, right? I mean, yeah. like if we take it to the metaphysical side, we're asking all the way down the chain of, of beings and asking for reasons for why they are the way they are or aren't differently. The answer of for no reason whatsoever, I think that's May Sue's kind of brilliant way of saying that's actually a good fucking answer. And we have to start to consider that as a real answer and not just a kind of way of waving it away. It's no longer a dismissal of thinking the unthinkable. It almost turned, this is finding, as you said earlier, finding the power of knowledge out of non-knowledge. It is taking this non-knowledge no longer as an epistemological limit, but as an ontological feature. It's a feature of being and not of thinking. How do you feel about that? Do you think, you think that, was, that was kind of good to wrap everything up? Did you yeah. have anything... I have a few other these like passages that I dug up that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, we can keep going. We can do another one or two if you want. Yeah, let maybe me just, maybe, maybe look maybe these no. over and see if there's anything that really would jump out. Oh, well, this is good, actually. <laughs> we could end on this. This part that I haven't gotten to, we, I'll let you read this if you want. But uh, let me anticipate by saying we spent a lot of time attacking the correlationists for ruining the meaning of scientific statements about the ancestral, about what there is when there is no thought, what it is to mean to think what there is when there is no thought. But one of the other things that he sees with what he calls, quote unquote, postmodernism broadly is through its skepticism and its rejection of all absolutes, it actually leads to a re-strengthening of the religious. Um, Ooh. Ooh, this is what good. I think that's we good. should end on. This is yeah. what I think we should end on. So does this, does this uh, quote have some of that here? I think it does. Thus, correlationism culminates in the following thesis. The unthinkable for us is not impossible in itself. It could be that there is the holy other subsisting beyond our relation to the world, God, or nothingness. It could be, as the subjectivist believes, that all is phenomenon, but it could be not and that the unthinkable transcends any conceptual discourse. This is why contemporary correlationism reveals itself often through a conversion operation of the philosophical discourse into a discourse of the holy other, which will always be a holy other discourse than the philosophical discourse, be it religious, theological, or poetic. This discourse will not be demonstrated as true, but defined as possible and inaccessible to the labor of the concept. In this sense, preserved from the works of thought and open to the offerings of piety. This is a good point to touch on, at least. And it's so essential to his project, right? Because he is, this is the other danger of correlationism. Not only does correlationism threaten science on the one hand, it threatens to resurrect every form of religious discourse, theological discourse, and grant them equal authority. Because what he's saying here, just to reiterate really quickly, is that by, with postmodernism or post-structuralism, whatever, with just, just the turn. The flattening out of all possible the, narrative, meta-narratives or whatever. Yeah, and by- As equiv- has yeah. having, there's no hierarchy. They're all, all are contingent, yeah. the equivalent. By disabsolutizing thought, by attacking all absolutes and holding them in a skeptical position, right? it actually leaves room for a kind of equivalence, that it's a level playing ground. It's a, yeah. level, it's a free-for-all. Because, because basically what he's saying is that this is kind of a, you know, Kant's religion within the limits of reason alone, this is kind of that taken to a hyper pitch. Because what Kant was trying to do was say, like, we need to find the boundaries of reason and leave room for faith. And that's what faith operates in is, is sort of not contaminated with reason. Mayasu says this is dangerous. This cannot be allowed to subsist and has to be fought back against because what happens is, is if we do not have an absolute, this is the speculative side because for him, speculation has to do with dealing with absolutes. This is why contingency is absolute. And that's, that's the speculative part of the materialism. If we don't have an absolute at all, then there's always this thing where it says, okay, thinking can go no further, but it's possible that all of these chimeras, all of these uh, gods and goddesses, and, uh, and it's a free-for-all. You can believe whatever you want. And I think for Mayasu, that is dangerous.
What's interesting, though, too, going back to our discussion with Chiesa is how this also like on the other side of this, the proliferation of sciences, the discourse of science or the knowledge or facts that it uncovers will only recapitulate additional gaps for faith to have a utility for. Right. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. So is he trying to like walk in between those two polarities to some degree right i think he's trying because to i say- think maybe both like both of these feel well i get what he's saying because you can see very clearly in our own sort of world how this the equivalents are flattening out of all meta narratives is problematic for society because then wild shit starts to get taken seriously yeah um, I- right I'll but at I'll the same it. time, yeah. science's dogmatic discourse is still g- going to generate endlessly these gaps in because we can't obtain this absolute knowledge. So there will always be gaps from which religion will sort of remain or some type of faith is going to persist regardless of how many facts we uncover about the absolute. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a related thing, right? You were talking about the gaps in science and knowledge that religion can nestle in. And I think that's Kaeza's point. And that's a really good point, honestly. And I think it's a related problem to what uh, Mayasu was trying to say, where he's saying it makes sense to be skeptical and to attack any absolute, but that leaves the room for any absolute to fill that void. Right. And he tries to fill that void ahead of time with contingency, which is beautiful because it proscribes, it totally prevents any necessary being, which is the majority of the absolutes that are that right, would yeah. take the place of contingency. <laughs> it's kind of a brilliant move. And um, and I think that that's why for him, he wants to say, we can't be dogmatic and declare the non-existence of God or the existence of God. Neither of those are, because that's a necessity that violates our reasoning. <laughs> there, there has to be this third way. This is why the divine in existence is interesting because it is... We need a non-absolute. This not yet God. Yeah. And this God who wouldn't be an absolute, but an ultimate. This is like, yeah. this is where it gets very tricky, but contingency would still be absolute. I think for him, Yeah. in this future of egalitarian justice yeah. that would reign... But besides the point, uh, <laughs> we don't have time to go into to that necessarily. But he is trying to say that the questioning, as you said, of the skepticism towards a dogmatic realism or any dogmatisms or naive realisms leads through the back door all these different religious absolutes and all these different uh, absolutes to come and fill that void. And I think that's why he's also careful to try to articulate the way that the scientist can proceed in a way that defeats the correlationist instead of uh, hiding from it and dismissing it and going back into naivete and go back to a naive realism of just saying, well, things exist outside our thought and that's just the way it is. I think for him, that dogmatism and naivete has to become more subtle, at least insofar as we are philosophically discussing science's role. Because I think for him, to a certain extent, science is necessarily realist and to a certain extent, science doesn't necessarily have to deal with its own naivete. Mm -hmm. Not in the way in which I think Mayasu is saying the speculative materialist is going to deal with it. If the scientist isn't always arguing with the correlationist, then the speculative materialist can uh, can step in for them and make sure that uh, that they don't get bothered by the fucking gadfly of the correlationist. Science, the scientists can keep doing what they're doing. They have other things to worry about. You want to stop there? I think so. That will wrap up another edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. Next week, we will be speaking to Grant Maxwell about his new book, so stay tuned for that one. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there 
Remember the complete the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in uh, block work or anything.